He wanted me to be inspirational. And I said, great, I get to be inspirational. And then he said, well, I want you to talk about testing too. And I thought, well, geez, I don't know if I can talk about testing and be inspirational, but I'll give it a try. So today's talk, let me go back. Today's talk is about the eighth habit of being an effective software tester. And it actually doesn't have anything to do with testing itself. But first, let me go into a journey. I know that everybody seems to be talking about journeys, so I'd like to talk about a journey as well. This is my work stuff. That's not really my journey. That's just a bunch of words. What you probably really want to know is where I started. And so my parents were divorced when I was very young. And I was basically raised, not by wolves, but by, from age six, I was raised by a, I would say, a kind word would be a redneck. And he said, when I was 15, he said, and he worked in a factory. He said, son, I got you a job at my factory. You're going to be coming to work every day at three. And I said, oh, OK, OK, dad. So I went to work at the factory. And that's actually the factory there. I got that off of Google. But every step of the way, I learned something new. And you'll see. So at the factory, I did odd jobs. I started off sweeping, and then I would, I would grease all the machines. And then they started, me, started trusting me with measuring. So we would put together like the steel for this building here. And the steel for this building here, I can see, has lots of different beams. And we would have to cut the steel, right? So I would go along and I would measure the length of the steel, and then I would mark it. Somebody else would come behind me and they'd cut it with a torch, right? And then I would grind it. You ever, anybody here ever use a grinder before? I would, grind the, I would grind the steel because it's all rough on the edges after you burn it, burn it off, right? So I did that every day after school for um, about a year. And then I decided, well, I don't think that's for me. Then I went to work at a gas station. And I pumped gas for a while. And at the gas station, I learned about satisfying and exceeding customer expectations. See, back then, we had full service. Anybody here know what full service is, gas station? OK, they, we had full service. So I would walk up to the customers, and I would say, would you like your windows washed? Even some of them would say, yeah, OK. So I'd wash the front window. And I noticed that if I also wash the side and the back, they may give me a dollar tip because I had exceeded their expectations. So that's where I learned how important it is to really know what's expected from the user and from the customer. And I could get a dollar. I decided I didn't want to do that anymore. And I went to work at McDonald's. Anybody here work at McDonald's before? No? OK. I'm the only guy here that's worked at McDonald's. Well, at McDonald's, everybody starts cleaning the bathrooms. So I started off cleaning bathrooms and washing the floors at McDonald's. And um, I thought it was really unfair because all the pretty girls, they got to work up front at the cashier. And here I was scrubbing the bathrooms, and it was just really not a fun job. But I did get promoted. And soon, I was able to make pancakes. Now, I learned a lot about process for pancakes at McDonald's. You see, everything, every pancake has to be identical, right? So we would have this thing that we would squeeze the batter, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then we'd press a button, and it'd go beep, beep, beep. And then 30 seconds later, go beep, 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 and you flip the pancakes, and you press the button again. You wait 30 more seconds, go beep, 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 and you put the pancakes in the container, and you ship it off. So I learned a lot about how can you have somebody that's 16 or 17 years old make great pancakes? How can you have a process where just about anybody could do something and produce pretty good quality stuff? Then I went to work 
in a shopping mall, and I sold, it was at a kiosk in the middle of the mall, and we sold fruits and nuts. And being a shy kid, I had a hard time working in the shopping mall because I had to yell out into the mall to sell stuff. And I can still remember today, would you like to try a banana chip? And I would lure the customers into our kiosk, to try a banana chip. They were $1.49 a pound. And then I would try to sell them pistachios. They were $7.99 a pound. Or cashews, they were $8.99 a pound. So I learned about placing things in the right location to guide the user through the path. In order, so I, I actually became the number one salesman for cashews and pistachios. Somehow I managed to get to Cornell University. My family didn't have a computer. My dad said, what do you need a computer for, boy? And so we didn't have a computer. We didn't have a printer. And when I think about it, those admissions officers must have really laughed because I hand wrote my essays. <laughs> but at least they probably thought, well, I guess his parents didn't help him do the essay, right? I hand wrote my essays and somehow I managed to get into Cornell. When I got to Cornell, I realized I wasn't very smart. You see, in high school, I went to such a small country bunk in high school, I was, I was smarter than everybody else. When I got to Cornell, everybody was smarter than me. And that's one of the reasons that I really like to come to conferences like this, is because I like to be around smart people that love software testing, just like I do. And I'm hoping today that I get to share some of my journey from Cornell to today. And along that way, I'm going to share with you some of the tips and tricks that I've learned about agile testing, and then share with you what I call the eighth habit, which is going beyond Stephen Covey's original seven habits. So let's think about how we got here today. Mark Anderson says, software is eating the world. But first, I think software got hungry, right? So we have hard disks that were invented in the 50s. Then we had personal computers, right? Of course, I didn't get to have one, but a lot of people had personal computers. Then we had T3 in the 1990s. Can you believe it? 45 megabits a second. Isn't that fast? 45. Ooh. You have that on your mobile phone now. That was T3, computer to computer uh, communications. Then we had Mark Anderson's software is in the world. And we had an acceleration of derivative technologies, right? We had cloud, which was dependent on hard drives and processing power. We had mobile, which was all depending on networking, right? And then we started thinking about Agile and how can we make software better and, and stuff like that. In 2001, we had the Agile Manifesto, right? And then Steve Jobs introduced what we called then the iPhone. 2011 is when Mark Anderson made his famous quote, software is eating the world. And then mobile began to eat the world because of the iPhone. And I think somewhere shortly after that, it became past tense. Software has eaten the world. What I've found in working with dozens, maybe hundreds of clients over the years is that being successful in Agile is not about how many test cases you execute. It's not about how many user stories you can do. It's not about um, you know, how great your code is. It's about some much simpler things that I think that we, and you notice I use humans, we've only started using this term in the last couple of years, you know, humans. 
something that we can do better than machines is actually be human. And I'm going to get to that. I gave a talk on the seven habits of highly effective agile a couple years ago. And one of the gentlemen in the audience was gracious enough to actually do a real sketch on it. And um, so here it is here. I'm going to talk about these briefly before we get to the eighth habit. Here's the foundation of my talk, which was about Stephen Covey and his original seven habits. Who's read that book? Anybody? OK. A few? Good. Stephen Covey's habits are really common sense. But as Mark Twain said, and maybe you know, common sense isn't so common, right? And sometimes we forget these things. But they do make common sense, right? Working together, thinking win-win, synergizing one plus one is greater than two, sharpening our saw, getting more tools in our toolkit, learning about different things, right? And then from that, I derived what I call the seven habits of highly effective agile testing. And we're going to go through these one by one, very briefly, and then finally get to the eighth habit, which is, I think, is going to help us beat the machines. OK. So the first habit is being proactive about being efficient and effective. There's a book called Joel on Software. Anybody ever read the book Joel on Software? It's an old book, but it's a fantastic book. One of the things I took away from the book that he said is, be smart and get things done. You can have lots of people that get things done, but if they're not smart, they're doing, they could be doing the wrong thing. Conversely, you may have somebody that's able to come into your office and pontificate about AI, but they can't get anything done. So, so what? Right? So that's called being efficient and effective, getting things done, being smart, right? The second thing is treating the user, second habit is treating the user like royalty. I believe that it's really essential to think not just from the user's point of view, but from anybody else's point of view other than your own. The number one habit of successful leaders is empathy. Actually, there are three characteristics, empathy being the first one. The second one is humility. And the third one is curiosity. So by being empathetic, we can do things like an 80-20 task analysis and really understand the top 20% tasks that provide 80% of the value if we really step inside the user's shoes. I'm going to do a, side, a sidebar here and talk about my other career. I, have, um, I like to grow vegetables. Who can name this vegetable? Anybody? Kurabi, right. I love, I love ve vegetables and making, uh, growing vegetables in my garden. I grow different things every year. So I've got uh, some tomatoes. I've got some kale there. I've got some basil. On the top there, we've got artichokes. So you may ask, what does gardening and Agile have in common? Anybody know? What does gardening and Agile have in common? Well, in gardening, we also have iterations, and we're always trying to continuously improve. If I waste an iteration in gardening, that's one whole year lost. Right? So when I take a look at those tomatoes, I think, geez, you know, Maybe it didn't work so well here. Maybe I should move them over here where it's a little bit less sunny or something like that. I don't grow kale anymore because the aphids love kale. I don't grow kale. 
So we have to take lessons from gardening and maintain an improvement frame of mind. Improving through continuous tracking and measurement. This is a graph that I took from my Garmin. Who here wears a Garmin? You guys wear Garmin's? Okay, all right. There's Garmin lovers out there. Well, you can see there, there's a lot of weird things going on. And about three, four years ago, I noticed that when I was riding downhill, my heart rate didn't go down. And I was like, geez, you know, something's wrong here. My heart rate should be going down when I'm riding downhill. And I went to the doctor and she said, well, maybe you're just getting old. I said, no, I'm not getting old. She said, maybe your garment's not working right. I said, no, it's working correctly. And finally she said, well, how about, what would you make you happy if we, you know, would you, can we get you an uh, EKG? And I said, yeah, damn it. So I had, two, I had two years ago, I had surgery. I had AFib and I had it corrected. So con through continuous monitoring, and tracking, I was able to catch my own problem. The fourth habit is be agile, then do agile. You can't be agile unless you are agile, right? And there's this paradigm called be, do, have. Has anybody heard of the paradigm of be, do, have? The paradigm of be, do, have is that most of us think that if we get some beer and we go to the beach, that we'll have lots of chicks hanging out with us, right? Isn't that what we think? I did when I was young. But we forget about the being part. The being part is that we have to be the nice guy first. Okay? And when you apply the be, do, have paradigm to Agile, what do you get? Well, we're doing all these things. We're having sprints and iterations and stand-up meetings and, and things like that. And we expect to have results. But what is the way of being that is the most important to generate those things that we're doing? Well, we have to be communicative. We have to be collaborative, right? We have to be responsible, responsive. All of these things that we have to be in order to make Agile work. Have you ever been to a stand-up meeting where everybody says, yep, everything's all right, yep. Is that, is that being what's necessary for Agile? Is that being communicative or collaborative? No. Habit number five. Think tasks, not roles, right? So a lot of, you know, there's been a lot of talk about us testers learning how to code and, and uh, everybody being responsible for quality and everybody being responsible for testing. But the fact remains that some people are better at other things, at some things and other people are not. And so what I say is go where you're wanted and needed. Go where you're, and that's, that's a, a big combination there, wanted and needed. You could be needed, but people don't, ah, we don't need that, we don't, want, we don't want that, right? So you have to have both, and pick up those extra skills so you are wanted and needed. The sixth habit is based on Jerry Maguire. Has anybody seen Jerry Maguire video? Okay. I'm going to play this one section here because it, when I talk to my clients sometimes and I can't seem to get through to them, I send them this video clip and then I go have a meeting with them. Can you play the clip, please? I am out here for you. You don't know what it's like to be me out here for you. It is an up at dawn, pride swallowing siege that I will never fully tell you about, okay? Help me! Help me, Rod. Help me! Help you. Help me. Help me. Help me. Help you. <laughs> Sorry. You 
while hanging on by a very thin thread. This last part is really important where he says, And I dig that about you. No contract, I help me, I help you, help everybody. <laughs> that's, my, that's my man. Hey, I'm happy to entertain you. Help me, help me. <laughs> See you, boss. Jerry, come on, man. Hey, see, that's the difference between us. You think we're fighting, and I think we're finally talking. I think we're finally talking. So a lot of times I have arguments or whatever with my clients or disagreements, and, you know, I'm really just trying to help them. And I, I send them this little video clip, and I say, hey, you know, let's have, a, let's have lunch tomorrow. The seventh habit is thinking long term, right? Agile is a long-term game, just like anything else. You want to do what's sustainable. So one of the metrics that we went over in um, the tutorial yesterday was what kind of things would show that you're sustainable? How can you measure sustainability? And I think one of the things that measures sustainability is the amount of overtime. If you're putting in a lot of overtime, that's not sustainable. And that's something that's often overlooked. The last part is you can't compare yourself with others. Okay? So I do, I do triathlons. This is me just a few months ago. And I never, I can't compare myself with others because I'm so old. I just compare myself with the previous year. Can I, can I maintain? Can I not slow down, <laughs> right? Don't compare yourself with others. So when other teams may say, oh, we have velocity of 42 or whatever, you know, you say, okay, well, that's good. So here we are. We've gone through the seven habits. The seven habits help us with effectiveness and efficiency, right? And we've heard a lot about AI, maybe even... Diani here tomorrow, he'll, he'll tell you that AI is eating the world. Maybe. Right? We know the world is eating data. Data is being produced faster than ever before. So how long can we hold out? Who will save us from Diani's AI testing ap apocalypse? Will it be the king of testing? I don't think so. He's not going to save us. Will it be the queen of AI? I don't think so. She's not going to save us. It's up to us as humans, and I'm going to tell you how via the eighth habit. Tariq, in a talk a, a few months ago, talked about testers being superheroes, and I think we are. We dedicate so much time to come here, to learn about new stuff, dedicate ourselves to our craft, our career, years and years of learning. We are certainly superheroes. The question is, how do we replicate ourselves? How do we do something more than linear, right? You can't just keep adding, adding people. Right? That just doesn't scale. So how do we get from there on the red line where we're just going like this? Well, you can use automation to get on the blue line, but what can you use to really scale up and accelerate our productivity and effectiveness? And that's what the eighth habit is about. The eighth habit is about finding our voice and inspiring others to find theirs. Now I'm going to do a sidebar here just for a second. So who here reads paper books? Anybody here read paper books? Okay. I read paper books. A lot of people say, oh yeah, I read on my Kindle, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, I like to read paper books. There's two reasons I like to read paper books. The first reason is because I like to trade with my friends. You cannot trade electronic books. 
The second reason is I like to give books away. So I'm going to give, I'm going to give my book away. So who wants, who wants my book on... There you go. All right. So how can we utilize Stephen Covey's eighth habit, finding our voice and inspiring others? Well, let's talk about man and machines again. How did we, as human beings, come to rule the animal kingdom? Well, one part of it is that communication is in our DNA. A lot of researchers, including Steven Pinker here, I've quoted him, have researched that actually there is like a communication gene, right? Now, I don't have a lot of the gene. I have a little bit of the gene. But what does the communication gene enable us to do? Well, if you take two, say, teammates, and they have, and they're you know, maybe they're grunting at each other and saying very rudimentary language. And you have two other teammates, and they're trying to kill each other, right? And the two teammates that have better communication, they're saying, okay, well, you go around there, and you go to the side, and I'm going to flush them out from over this side. Who do you think is going to win? Those guys that can communicate complex things are going to win. The second thing that we humans have is collaboration at scale and complex collaboration at scale. So I can't remember who it was that said that the bots beat 70 people. Let's see them beat 7,000 people or 70,000 people. That's what differentiates us from ants. You see, ants, you can get a lot of ants but they can only do very simple things. And the same thing with bees. We as humans, we can collaborate at high numbers because we can believe in abstract concepts. We can believe in religion, in churches. We can believe in governments. We can believe in money. The only thing that makes money worth anything is because all of us believe that it is. It's an abstract concept. But when you get 8 billion people believing that money means something, then it becomes powerful. We can believe so much that we can go out and kill a million people for some cause that's abstract as a nation. So that's the power of us humans, communication and collaboration, and that is what the eighth habit is about. So as far as the difference is, you can refer to the difference going back to really the first seven habits on thinking win-win, synergizing. So the eighth habit in terms of Helping others to find their voice and finding your own voice is really about communication and collaboration. I'm going to talk about three elements here. The first one is trust. The second is feedback. And the third is speaking or finding your voice. First, trust requires a deep understanding. The reason I love traveling so much is it really opens up my, my eyes. And I'm really proud to be here in a, in a conference that has 31 countries represented. That is really amazing. Um, just incredible. And did you know that only 36% of Americans hold a passport? That explains what's happening in the United States today. Because the United States is like this, right? 36% of Americans have a passport. That's amazing. So 
So what parts of Agile depend on trust? Well, just about every part, right? Because we're all supposed to be working as a team, all use a common goal, have these meetings together. And in order to work together, we have to trust each other. But trust is a big word. Who here can tell me what their definition of trust is? Anybody? No? Okay. Oh, Roy? Being vulnerable. Being vulnerable. Okay, that's a good one. Being vulnerable is a big word, though. And, but let's talk about that. The first element, well, first of all, we, a lot of us think of trust as kind of a mushy thing that's hard to define, right? But we can actually define it in four elements and do something about it. So the first element is predictability. Second being exchange, reciprocity, and like Roy said, vulnerability. So element one, predictability. Your friend asks you to meet him at 6 o'clock for dinner, and you don't show up. That is not trustful action, right? That's not, you're not predictable. He cannot predict if 6 o'clock dinner, maybe I can go out with another friend at 8, right? That's unpredictable. Same thing at work. When you say you're going to get something done and you do, that starts to create trust, right? The second element is exchange. Just about every interaction has exchange. So when you go to a restaurant and you pay 10 euros for a meal, and you think, yeah, that's pretty good, that's, that's worth $10, all right, then you go back. If you don't feel that way, you don't go back, right? You have to have fair exchange. The third element is reciprocity. And reciprocity is kind of an interesting one. If, you, if your friend calls you and asks you to help them move house, you go over and help them move, then maybe Sometime in the distant future, when you move, you may give him a call and ask him to help you. Maybe he'll say, oh, I'm too busy. Right? It's something in the distant future. You don't know if it's going to happen or not. And let's say he asks you again for help, and you help again. And you help again. Sooner or later, you start thinking, hmm, this doesn't seem so good here. Right? But it also works the other way around. Let me give you an example. Jennifer has treated me for dinner, I think, three times. And I'm thinking to myself, geez, I want the opportunity to treat her. I want to have that flow of trust, of exchange with Jennifer. I don't want her to always treat me. And so that occurs in all of our relationships. You want it to be kind of flowing, right? And that's why I hate going out with friends and they say, oh, let's go Dutch. Well, go Dutch means, okay, we're even Steve and we're going to walk away and everything's fair and we're not going to, if we don't see each other, that's okay with me. The last element is what Roy was talking about in terms of vulnerability. Now, a lot of times you may think of vulnerability as you know, you're crying with your loved one and, and something like that. But vulnerability means a couple things. First of all, like for instance, you know, that you could tell your secrets maybe and you don't want your friend to tell your secrets because you, you make yourself vulnerable. But other ways of being vulnerable, for instance, are let's say I go to the store and I accidentally pay the cashier too much money and I start walking away and he, he says, hey, wait, you paid me too much money. I walk back to that guy and think, wow, that guy's trustworthy. Right? Isn't that what you think when that happens? He could have taken advantage of you and stolen your money, but he didn't.
So the thing about all these elements of trust is that they reduce or remove uncertainty. And that's one of the key tenets of establishing trust. And trust, as we know, is the foundation of all our relationships, whether it be a family or at work. Trust is continuously evolving. Every time there's a trust event, right, and you start in your mind, your neural network processes this, right? And you begin to build trust or you take it away. So we need trustful feedback. Now, feedback is the next part of the eighth habit. And feedback in listening and coaching is one of our primary responsibilities as leaders in our organizations. Most employees don't think they get it. Maybe they don't even know what it is, right? A few weeks ago, we won a huge contract. I was really, really happy. We did a proposal and, you know, the client came and visited us and then I, I sat down with them and I said, well, and they said, well, you know why we chose your firm? And they said, we felt that your company culture aligned with ours. And I was like, oh, okay, great, that's, that's nice, all right. But I've always wondered, what is company culture? Is it just some signs that you have on the wall? Is it, as Tariq says about Ultimate Software, people first? Well, what the heck does people first mean? Okay? It's, those are big words. How can you put that into real practice? And I've wondered why people stay at my company for so long. And I finally got the answer the other day. The other day, I took one of our employees to a trade show and she helped us out. And then I took her to PNSQC, another conference. She spoke at the conference and presented a paper. And um, on the last day before she went back, I took her out for dinner and we had ice cream. And first of all, what has two thumbs and loves ice cream? Me, all right. Come on, you guys got to participate. Jeez. Okay. So we're having ice cream, and we're sitting there having ice cream, and I remembered that I had this memory, and I talked to her about the memory. I said, you know something? Her name is Siebel. I said, Siebel, you know something? This, this reminds me of my dad. And I said, one time when I was, I remember I was four, I was sitting there having ice cream with my dad. So I want you to take a deep breath and close your eyes. Take a deep breath and close your eyes. Imagine you're eating ice cream with your dad, you're four years old, and your ice cream falls on the floor. Open your eyes. Okay. So my ice cream fell on the floor. And I was thinking, shit, my, he's gonna get, my dad's going to get mad at me, right? And he didn't get mad at me. He, he, uh, he said, son, when you eat your ice cream, you have to push down on the ice cream in the beginning to push it down to the cone before you lick it on the sides. If you lick it on the sides, you're going to push it off the cone. And then he gave me his ice cream. I was like, wow, he didn't get mad at me. I, I didn't have these complex thoughts at the time. I probably said, all right, just get his ice cream, you know? And so after I told this story to my employee, she said, you give us your ice cream. And I said, what are you, what are you talking about? And she said, the other day at the trade show, I made a big mistake. And you didn't get mad. You just pointed out the mistake you told me how we could fix it, and you told me the thinking that I had to have in order to prevent it. That was giving us your ice cream. And so, to me, that was the, the, the final piece of why people stay at my company so long. People have been at my, my company has only been in existence for 13 years, but I've got half of my people have been there for over five years. 
And we have 80, 80 folks in the company. Amazing. So my lesson to you um, for feedback is give your ice cream away. Right? We hold ourselves back from giving feedback because we're afraid. We're afraid of conflict. We think, oh, you know, this is going to upset them, or oh, I want to be happy at work. Right? So we don't give good feedback. But it's possible to give feedback if we're direct and compassionate. It's a fine balancing act. You could be compassionate, but then not really see, any, see anything, and then the, the employee kind of gets misaligned. They don't know what, what they can do to improve. You can be indifferent, right? You're not direct, you're not compassionate, you just say, oh yeah, you did pretty good. Yeah, all right, you did all right. Or you can give really good constructive feedback in a caring way. Of course, feedback works both ways. I remember a couple years ago, one of my employees walked into my office and said, Phil, you shouldn't have done that. That was a mistake. And I, I said, oh. And she explained to me what it was. And I, thought, I said, yeah, you're right. That was a mistake. I got to fix that. So you have to be open to receiving feedback as well, right? Practice makes perfect. You ever heard that before? That's wrong. Whoever told you practice makes perfect was lying. Okay? That's fake news. Practice with feedback makes perfect. And the reason I have this swimmer up here is because for the longest time, I do, you saw me in that one competition there, for the longest time I, I've been doing triathlons. And when I get out of the swim, I'm just exhausted. I can barely move. And the reason, after getting coaching and feedback, I actually had somebody film me in the water. The reason is that I was lifting my head up too much. When you lift your head up a lot, it makes your hips and your legs sink down. So I was basically pushing through the water like this. No matter how hard I trained, I was not going to go very fast. So until I got feedback, then I was able to breathe more to the side. They call it the goggle drill. You have one, one eye in the, in the water and you have one eye above the water. They call it the goggle drill. And so when you go like that and get your head down, your, your butt automatically goes up and you start gliding across the water. It was amazing. But I, I needed feedback to get that. So practice didn't work. Practice with feedback is what works. Feedback is critical to iteration, right? We need to have feedback every time we iterate in Agile. And we need to look at our successes and our failures. I present this slide in our, in our um, metrics tutorials because I think it's important to understand why we're successful just like when my company won that project, why did we win? I really wanted to know what company culture meant, and I finally figured it out. And it's important to know why we fail. Of course, we always take a look at why we fail, but it's important to look at success as well. So how do we go from effectiveness to greatness? Well, we have the seven ha habits, right? That gets us part of the way. And then we have these two things called trust and feedback, which we've just gone over. So there's one missing element. And the last element is finding our voice. So, you all you all know that I was raised close to Washington, D.C. in Virginia. I now live in San Francisco, but in between, I've, I've spent quite a few years in Beijing. I'm going to get a little vulnerable here. In 2000, when my mom died, I got really depressed and I ran away, and I ran, I went to China, all by myself, 
just exploring, discovering. And I happened to run into a professor at a big university there. And then I started, I was able to start my PhD program in China. When I went there, I knew no, no Chinese. I was born in Washington, D.C., raised by a redneck, remember? He didn't speak no Chinese. And so it's been a long journey to find my voice. Do you know what gravity of Earth is? Tariq, do you know? What's the, the value of the gravity of Earth? Diandi, do you know? No? Okay. How about Avogadro's number? No? Roy, do you know? Okay. The reason we don't know is because we no longer need to know. We can just look it up. But back at 20 years ago, we had to memorize all this stuff. Now we can just look it up. So one of the first things my PhD advisor made me do is she made me read this book called Linked. It's by Al Barabasi. Amazing book talks about the power function, and at the time, it was published in 2002, he talked about, well, you know, why is it that Google and Yahoo are so smart? Is because they're always collecting information. They're out there networking, right? They're networking with all these nodes, gathering information, similar to what we're doing here today. We're networking, we're gathering information. If you went and asked 20 people here three good questions about AI, you would get much, much smarter. Then you go to the next conference, you revise your questions, and you ask those questions to 20 more people. And you start implementing linked. So I realized, so I had to do this presentation on this book, right? And I'm in China, one PhD advisor has maybe 20 students. So we're sitting around and I have to present this book. And I get up, it's my turn to present, and I'm just, I'm just sweating all over. I'm just, I just, and after I got done, she said, she said, um, well, it doesn't matter how good your ideas are if you can't communicate them. And I knew she was talking to me, even though there was 20 people in there. But I knew that I needed to do this. I needed to get out and talk to people. But there was a big problem. There's a big problem. I'm an introvert. Who here is an introvert like me? Raise your hand. Okay, there's a lot of, there's a lot of us in here, right? Unfortunately, I don't have that book to share. I'm going to give this book away, though. Who wants the book called Linked? Um, so it's up to us to find our voice, right? Practice with feedback got me here today. That's why it's so important. Why do you think the conference thinks that these feedback, these evaluations are so important? We read those things, right? It's important. Practice with feedback enabled me to find my voice. So my challenge to you, my challenge to you in a world that just can't stop talking is to find your voice and inspire others. Inspire others to their greatness like Tariq is helping us to do here today. He inspired me today. So there's just one more lesson I'd like to share with you, one more story. This is Mr. Larson. Mr. Larson was my high school teacher. I went and saw him about five years ago. I called him up and I said, Mr. Larson, I'd like to come see you. And he's, he's pretty old now, he's 70-something. He says, 
okay, sure, come on over, right? And I go over there to Mr. Larson. I'm sitting on the couch, and Mr. Larson, we're having some coffee. And I say, Mr. Larson, I want to thank you for a lesson that you taught me in class. And he's like, what was that? And I said, well, one day in class, at the end of class, you gave us homework. And one of the students in the back of the class said, Mr. Larson, that's not fair. Mr. Greer already gave us homework, and you gave us homework yesterday. And you know how teachers are up at the front, you know, missing with their papers and stuff like that. Mr. Larson stood up like this, and he said, when you were born, did the doctor hold you up and say, life is fair, life is fair, life is fair? No, he didn't. Do your homework. And, you know, I told Mr. Larson then, I, I said, you know, whenever I think about things that are not fair or things that are just not going my way, I just keep going. And he said, he said, well, if that's all you got in all those hours in class, that's still pretty darn good because that's a really important one. And I will never equal Mr. Larson but I hope that you got something from today that you can take home with you for a long time. Thank you. I was absolutely sure you are going to have questions and you have some. And though you have a little bit more than three minutes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, why did I want to... Well, you know, working in a, why did I want a previous job like a factory in McDonald's after you decided to do an IT career? Well, I'll tell you, working in a factory is hard work. Every day I finished work and I would get home and I would be exhausted and I would be dirty and I would have black dust in my nose from all the steel dust. All right, and I said, well, I don't want to do that. I would blow my nose and all this black stuff would come out. So I went to work at McDonald's, right? And I was like, well, okay. There I got to smell all the dirty bathrooms. I didn't want to do that. And I was looking around. I said, well, you know, I don't want to be the night manager. So after all that, I decided to go to college. And funny thing is, being from such a rinky-dink school that I went, we had no AP classes, nothing, right? And so... The only colleges I knew about were colleges that had football teams that were on TV. So I applied to Ohio State, Michigan, and then somehow my mom just threw out this name, Cornell. Maybe she read it in the news. She said, oh, why don't you apply to Cornell? I said, oh, okay. You know, so I applied to Cornell, Ohio State, and Michigan. That was it, and luckily I got into Cornell. Wow. If I could come up with a ninth habit, what would that be? Well, I guess that'll be the title of my next talk. I don't know. How to, how to build trust with C-level management. Well, I think building trust with C-level management has to do with that compassion and directness. They have to know that you have the company's best interests in mind. When my employee came and basically yelling at me, saying, hey, Phil, you made a mistake. What I heard, she said it in a way that made me hear that she cared about the company. So if you talk to executives like you care about the company, they're going to listen to you. Let's see. Habit number three, how is it possible to avoid comparing yourself to others in a market full of competition. Well, I think just as in any company, in any team, you want to be the best that you can be. That's all that I can really say about that. You just want to be the best that you can be. And if you truly are the best that you can be, you probably be better than other teams or other companies. I have 39 seconds. I guess I can get one more here. <sighs> Okay, what are your thoughts on anonymous versus open feedback? 
I think you're talking about those open suggestion boxes or things like that, right? I think we don't have those suggestion boxes. I know a lot of companies do. The environment that we've created in our company is that we really foster and encourage and want to talk to each other, and we provide those opportunities to do that. We have a lot of, I guess you could call them happy hours, um, but providing that opportunity for communication and collaboration is, is what it's all about. So, thank you. <laughs>